Welcome to this year's Deloitte Digital Agenda 2020, the streaming edition. My name is Christiane Weiler and I am your host in this series of very exciting and inspiring keynote talks. You are going to meet five top speakers and you are going to learn about innovation and creativity and how to do business in the future. Just to get you a little excited about this, who you're going to meet coming up here is um, Tom Goodwin, about to come up here on stage. Uh, award a number one voice in uh, marketing on LinkedIn, a lot of other things. You're going to meet him very soon. Uh, we also have Steve Stadler, author, podcaster, and uh, senior vice president at Villiard. We have Samuel West. He's the founder of the Museum of Failure. I'm very excited to hear about that also. And of course, Linda Lucas, she's a programmer and also a storyteller and illustrator. These are all the amazing speakers that we have in this series of talks for you. On digitalagenda.dk, you can find the link and you can follow this program live or you can watch it at your own convenience. The code is DA2020. In this second talk, we're going to hear about business transformation in the post-digital age. Because what are the rules for businesses now? How do we unleash the power of the new in an era of radically different consumer expectations? The speaker you're about to meet will uncover the opportunities of digital disruption and what it brings, outlining trends and stimuli to spark new thinking, and he will also show the way in which you can drive transformation by tapping into what's newly possible and putting technology at the heart of business. He's been twice voted as number one marketing uh, in voice uh, on marketing on LinkedIn. He was named one of 30 people to watch on Twitter by Business Insider and a must follow from Fast Company. He's an industry provocateur, keynote speaker, a commentator on the future of advertising and marketing in business. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the head of futures and insights at Publicis Group. His name is Tom Goodwin and here he is. <laughs> Thank you very Welcome. much. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. I'm aware these days are quite strange and unexpected, and I'm here to be optimistic about what an amazing time to be in business is right now. Um, so this presentation will take about 35 minutes, and it's designed to be a provocative look at the future, putting change in context, and making us realize the power and profound opportunities that lay ahead of us. Um, I've called this presentation Business Transformation for the Post-Digital Age. There are two things to get from this. One is this idea of business transformation. I'm going to define it. What does it mean? What does it not mean? And I'm going to talk about this idea of the post-digital age. And this is the era where we understand new consumer behaviors. We understand new consumer expectations. And we start to unleash the power of technology around them. There is an amazing relationship between technology and society and creativity and business. It was something as boring as the invention of the oil metal paint tube, which allowed the impressionist movement to grow. Before this, painting looked very different. If you're an architect, it was the invention of the first elevator that allowed your job to change dramatically such that you could build skyscrapers. The entire fabric of society, the entire aesthetics and movement around cities radically changed. It was an amazing time to be an architect. It was the invention of CADs, computer-aided design in the 1970s, that allowed buildings to take on incredible new fluid forms. The canvas of possibility was radically transformed by something as simple and as kind of benign looking as software. And even now, the kind of uh, the adoption of Instagram, just the social media app that's used by people around the world, now means that architects get radically different briefs. So now $250 million has been spent on building something as beautiful but as pointless as the, this building in New York. Um, and this not only makes you realize there's an incredible relationship between technology and business and design, but it also asks the questions about how that technology is used. And from the paint tube to the elevator, um, to the more dramatic buildings allowable by CAD, to the large Donner Kebab building that you saw in New York, you realize that this is not about retrofitting. 
It's about what you can create with this new tool. So hotels that have elevators added look no different. Buildings that have small logos added for Instagram don't seem that exciting. Paintings that were done in the old form with oil, but not transformative. It was about what this technology made possible, and it was how people unleashed it where things got exciting. Now, most of us listening to this have grown up in an era where the internet has been invented and has taken over many aspects of our lives. We've grown up in an era where smartphones have become adopted very freely. These are profound new technologies. If you imagine what the metal paint tube did, if you imagine what Instagram have done, if you think about what computer-aided design meant for architects, those were incredibly exciting days. The days when those technologies arrived were probably the best time ever to do our roles. But yet, the feeling as I look around the world and the feelings as I go to conferences are that many people in business, especially the people at the very top, act as if they wish that technology had never happened. They're kind of burying their sand, they're hoping to kind of survive, they're hoping that the big changes don't really happen on their watch. And I'm kind of here to change that. Like as you look around the world today, you don't go to shopping malls and get the feeling that the stores or the shopping center management got incredibly excited by technology. You don't check into a hotel and feel like a whole task force was put together to make every process within that hotel delightful in this world of new technology. You don't go to websites and think that the whole team of people really relished the power of the new and they reimagined every single interface. You get the feeling they took a catalog and just moved it over. Even things like the office today. Most offices do not show a reimagination of workflows. They're not enthusiastically embracing the power of artificial intelligence. They're kind of augmented, perhaps with a fax machine and a nice photocopier. So if there's one thing that you get from this talk, I'd love you to be incredibly excited. I'd love you to realize that this is a wonderful time to do our jobs, and you, by definition of listening to this, stream are kind of ordained with a power to be the people that makes amazing things possible. So a little guide to the next 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more of an introduction and talk more about my role because it helps set up the context. I'm going to talk about this idea of the post-digital age and what happens when we really get technology and understand its meaning rather than just what it does. I'm going to talk about this idea of digital transformation and help define it. And then I'm going to give you sort of 10 tips for the future and 10 ways to think about new technology and how to embrace it. So the first thing I most commonly get asked is what my role is. Very simply, it's looking at these two things. What is changing in the world? And almost more importantly, what is not? Because it's easy to get carried away by the dramatic changes in oil prices or city development. But actually, if you look around you today, most aspects of the modern life are not that different. We're not seeing drones delivering us coffee most days. Most furniture in our homes is not 3D printed. We don't tend to buy most things with Bitcoin. And I look at what matters and what doesn't. Because often the technologies that are really, really exciting um, are actually invisible. You know, it's bits of code, it's things like APIs, it's, um, it's often not the very dramatic things like virtual reality headsets that take on a more physical form. You know, smart speakers probably won't change the dynamics of your business. Um, open architecture um, might do. So that's a broad description of my role. I, I tend to focus on people and imagination more than technology. Um, so this little contraption that you see on your screen now, um, this is a great example of human ingenuity in the digital age. So in China, um, they give out pedometers and you get cheaper and subsidized health insurance if you do over a certain number of steps. It was quite easy to predict that that might be a business model that would develop. Um, but they've gone one step further and then now is a whole array of contraptions like this that swing your phone and register artificial steps so you're able to beat the system, so to speak. Um, so I do this for the Publicist Group. Um, it's one of the world's largest holding companies. Um, we have an array of agencies. Here's a couple of them, Saatchi and Saatchi, Publicist, Sapient. 
um, MSL, Starcom, Digitas. And we have a massive array of clients that we work with, so some of the largest brands in the world. But my job for them is to guide our clients, and it's to get them um, well-placed on this spectrum. So there are many people right now that are probably sleeping too well. There are many businesses that are perhaps facing existential change, and people with senior management may be perhaps a little bit too complacent. Um, perhaps they're not excited enough. And it's my job to wake those people up. At the opposite end of the scale, there are many people who've been told that blockchain will destroy their business, or you're either a startup or a leave behind. Um, and it's my job to reassure them. You know, the, the, the main fundamentals in the world do not change radically from one day to the next. The pace of change is often more slow than the press would have you believe. So it's to find the right, right kind of middle ground in this spectrum. Um, a lot of the thinking that you see here and a lot of the questions that I ask on social media are kind of based in this book I wrote. Um, and the principle behind this book and the reasons for it to be written were based on this idea of what would you look like if you were to set up your business today? Like the, the elements of change is such that it's almost easier to construct something now rather than to change it. So this book was designed to look at how we might do that. One of the core elements of the book was to look at this idea of innovation and how it spreads, or more accurately, how it doesn't spread. Because we often see that most innovation uh, doesn't spread particularly quickly, and it often takes root in quite simplistic ways. As you can see on this uh, slide, um, you know, factories that were constructed during the first part of the Industrial Revolution were driven by huge contraptions and vast systems of millwork that created the energy to drive the entire factory. And they were built with water wheels to drive all of that machinery. And when steam engines and steam power was first invented, they used the steam engines not to drive the same machinery directly, but merely to lift up water to power the same water wheels. And that seems extraordinary in retrospect, but at the time there was a consensus that the main use of steam should be to augment the mill stream and to make sure there was always water if it was required. Um, the first uses of electricity were merely to replace marginal items. So they were first used for Christmas tree lighting and then for street lighting. They didn't really change the world for quite a significant period of time because no one really knew what electricity meant. No one really knew why it existed or why we needed it. You realize in retrospect, so hindsight is a wonderful thing, that it was only when we rethought around the meaning of that technology that things got really amazing. So when people constructed things that had never been imagined or seen before, like steam engines, the entire transportation system of Britain and Europe and the world changed. When factories were born in the electrical age, they looked incredibly different to the factories before them because the entire architecture and work processes of the factory were rethought. In fact, it was the creation of new items with electricity where life got really interesting. So creating the world's first electrical fridge, creating the world's first electrical vacuum cleaner. It was the creation of these new items that completely changed the workforce. They completely changed the number of hours that people had to work domestically. They completely changed the economics of the world as literally tens of millions or hundreds of millions of women entered the workplace. You see, when you look back on these eras, that there are always three kind of epochs of change. There was the change, there was the time before the change. There's the time before the advent of this new technology where life is very calm. People understand the world, they understand their place in the world, they know how to make money. Then this new technology arrives and there is chaos. There is duplication, there are format wars as we add new technology to the old. We live both in the world of the new technology and the old technology at the same time. And this is the time when life feels complicated, people don't make money, people are uncertain, people are fearful of their jobs. It's this mid-stage where all the tension is. 
And then there is normally the post-technology world, where life settles down again, where the new world order is established, where people are broadly happy and more relaxed. And I think it's interesting to look at these three stages and to think about the comparative stage we are with the digital world and this era of connectivity. Because you will realize that there was a long period of time before the meaning of the technology was understood. There was a very long period of time when people were augmenting factories that were badly designed with new technology without realizing how silly they were. There is a long time for any of these shifts to happen. It took perhaps 50 or 60 years for the power of steam to really be digested and built upon. It took around 30 to 40 years for the power of electricity to change the world that much. And even right now, it's perhaps taken almost 20 years for us to really get to grips with the power of the internet. And it's important to understand why. Because by understanding the mistakes that are made, and by understanding the dynamics at work, we can seek to remove those barriers right now for how we deal with digital. There is absolutely the fear of the unknown. Like human beings are not particularly well designed for radical change. There is always no projected return on investment for these decisions because it's very hard to calculate the return on something that's not well understood yet. The return on the investment of something we can't really think about is extremely hard to calculate. Any form of radical rethinking takes a very long time. If you are a public company and you are held to account by quarterly reporting, it's extremely difficult to do something that takes one quarter, let alone perhaps eight. There's a degree of competency change that happens. Realistically, most companies are good at one thing. It is their core competency. To get a bank to be very good at understanding trusting, trust is one thing. To get a bank to understand trust, to understand finance, to understand technology is an altogether different task. TV companies are very good at making TV shows. To expect them to understand software is quite a radical change. To get them to recruit new people for the era of software is another step altogether. The investment levels required are often huge. The uh, costs of retooling a factory are huge, let alone rethinking your entire company. The degree of political collaboration that is required is huge. Interdepartmental collaboration is often something that kills any project before it's dead. To know that you may have to deal with procurement, legal, um, the construction, the retail parts of your business, the supply chain parts of your business. To work across many different departments is extremely hard. There's obviously a lot of risk involved. To do something that's never been done before just relies on a feeling of gut. And there's not really any urgency. Like most large companies tend to benchmark themselves against each other. You know, car companies lived in wonderful kind of complicit silence before Tesla appeared because they were all looking at each other, making sure they were keeping up with their nearest competitors. So there's often no real urgency to change until it's late. And my final point is um, there's no imagination of what doesn't exist yet. You can't know the answer to a question that's never been asked. So no one really knows what they're missing out on. No one can look at 5G right now and know that there's something they're supposed to be doing with it that they're not. It will seem obvious in 10 years' time when new businesses have been built with 5G that people missed a trick right now. But at the moment, we've got no idea what that is at all. So this brings me on to the second chapter which is this idea of the post-digital age. Now, every time a new technology arrives, we tend to create a new system around it. So if you look at money, we've gone from cowrie shells to metal coins uh, to paper notes to promissory notes like checks. Uh, we then have digital uh, permissions like credit cards. And then now we have digital wallets. And perhaps at some point in the future, we may have something like crypto. But even today, with the exception of cowrie shells, we operate with all of these systems of money at the same time. 
That makes life very, very complicated. We see this augmentation around us everywhere. This is a uh, food delivery store in San Francisco where they have to have an iPad for many different food apps and they have to continually add to this system. The TV set is similar. We now have hundreds of remote controls. The app architecture is complex. Things like payments are more complicated than ever. The different permutations of facial recognition, uh, fingerprints, face to pay. It's extraordinarily complex. Um, we live in kind of the future and the past at the same time. So you might be lucky enough to board a plane on Delta Airlines with your face as your boarding pass, but then the plane is still carrying literal paperwork that's printed by a dot matrix printer. We, we find at this moment in time, like the regulations of the past are being bended. So companies like Uber, Airbnb, scooters, they all live in this quasi-legal area where regulation wasn't really set up for this moment in time. And it's created blurred lines as well. Like media channels tend to have no meaning anymore. We don't know what is a movie. We don't know what a TV show is. We don't know what video is. We don't really know the, the implications or the meaning of something like social media. And as a result, because these devices have entered our life quite quickly, we're in this environment of societal confusion. No one really knows what the etiquette of dating is anymore. No one really knows what is a reasonable way for a company to behave. No one knows if it's okay for their kids to take phones to schools. There really is a degree of confusion that's out there. And we've dealt with this with these kind of digital patches. So this is a guy, I think, in India that's using a very sophisticated smartphone uh, to read the numbers on electricity meters. This is a wonderful way to visualize what we've done with new technology. We've used it as a patch on an old system because a rip out all these meters would be vastly expensive. And we tend to do digital replication. Uh, this is a wonderful piece of modern art, which is an LED candle. Uh, it costs $600. This is obviously a crap way to get light, but it's a good explanation of how we tend to pull the old through the new. A virtual reality shopping experience in some people's heads would be to go into a virtual reality shopping mall and look around virtual stores and pick up virtual items. We tend to be destined to kind of repeat the errors of the past. And we have to change that thinking. We have to really understand the difference between rethinking versus augmenting. We have to understand the profound difference between thinking of technology and connectivity and digital as oil to the old system or as oxygen to make new systems develop. And this is a good fabric to do that. The post-digital age is this great time to really build what we should have done in the first place. It's a great chance to learn the lessons from the past, to understand changing consumer behaviors, and to really rethink and build from scratch the companies we should have done in the first place. Digital transformation will be the process that gets us there. Broadly speaking, there are three types of company. If you think of companies as a kind of onion, if you think of them as several layers that are wrapped on top of other layers beneath them, the kind of outermost layer and the layer that people see most readily is the communications layer. This is the adverts, the PR that the company does. Underneath that is the marketing layer, the product, the price, the distribution, etc. Underneath that is the, the product or the service, the actual thing that the company is making or delivering. And right at the center of a business is its kind of business this model and its reason to exist. What you will realize is if you think of this construct, there are different types of businesses. There are those that are digital first, where the entire company has been conceived and created in the modern era. And these are the sort of companies that we often see. It's the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Spotify's, the Nest, the WeWork. They are often celebrated. And the valuation of these companies is extraordinary and changing very quickly on an almost hourly basis these days. But there are smaller versions. There's Lemonade, which does home contents insurance and has been completely challenging to incumbents. There are companies like Ocado, which rethink the entire shopping market ecosystem. Uh, there are companies like Klarna that are disrupting finance. There are companies in Denmark like Happy Helper, which is a completely different way to think about home help. So those companies is easy to get quite jealous of. Um, and what tends to happen is companies are very quick to try and emulate them. So they do something I call digitalization, which is to taking the outermost layers 
And to do something that's rather surface level, it's rather cheap, it's rather quick, um, it's politically easy, and it's not particularly risky. And it's to give the outward appearance of modernity. And what you tend to find is that there are retailers that perhaps add some iPads to their store. They don't rethink their supply chains, they just add to the existing experience an iPad. Um, you see banks, they add sort of pepper-like robots to perhaps one or two branches in the hope of getting some headlines about how they are a bank of the future or how they understand change. Um, you see stores add 3D printers as a way to get headlines about how contemporary and future-facing they are. Uh, and a store like IKEA, which has a, a less than perfect digital commerce experience, might use augmented reality as a kind of way to gloss over perhaps their reluctance to do e-commerce. So what companies really need to do is to digitally transform. This is to go much more deep within the company. It's to think about real existential change. Uh, this is much less superficial. It's very deep. It takes a long time. It's very politically difficult. It's expensive. Uh, and it's risky. So there are a few examples of this. Uh, one example would be Netflix turning from a DVD delivery business to an entertainment company. Uh, one example would be Argos, where they now sell other people's products in their physical stores. Another example would be Walmart, the way that they have embraced by online pickup in store and the way that they have rethought their supply chains. Uh, another example would be McDonald's. They've done a very good job of changing their digital kiosks and changing the workflow within their business. And a final example might be something like dark kitchens. So now in order to make profits, um, food delivery apps are starting to circumvent some regulation about food preparation and they're opening temporary spaces like this which allow them to save on costs sufficient, significantly. So this is what companies look like when they digitally transform. So you now have an interesting question. Regardless of your size or perhaps because of your size, you'll want to do one of three different things. Perhaps you will create a new entity. Perhaps you will digitally transform or perhaps you will be happy to digitalize. Which approach that you take um, will bring about different questions. If you're going to digitalize, your question is how deep do you go? Are you really happy to just take your existing ads and stick them on the internet? Or do you want to go a little deeper? Do you want to change the marketing? Do you want to change the distribution? Or do you want to go even deeper still and start thinking about the products or services that you make? If you're going to digitally transform, then probably your main question is, what is the appetite to do this? Like, How long do we have? How much money do we have? Is it going to be sustainable to pull this off facing perhaps shareholder or stakeholder pressure? And if you want to digitally create, your question is, how big do you want this thing to be? Is this a, a little innovation unit on the side of your business, or is this a much bigger business which is set to take significant revenue and significant focus away from your main entity. So finally, I wanted to leave you with, um, with 10 ways to drive this change, because it's easy to, to talk about this and it's easy to uh, theorize around it, but how do you actually make a difference? Uh, the first one is to kind of accept your reality uh, and to do so blamelessly. So I won't show this film, um, but this shows a kind of an amazing construction in, in Alaska. It's a kind of cabin that was originally 40 by 40. And over the years, this slightly crazy person added more and more layers. And now it's extremely tall. It's very precarious. It's full of patches and fixes and workarounds and tarpaulin and duct tape. And it's built in the wrong place. This is often what businesses are today. This is a perfect metaphor for what you have. Like everyone has worked tirelessly and ingeniously and perfectly for years to create something which is perhaps not really what you should have done. And it's important to understand this and to do so without blame. Like everyone has been well-intentioned. Um, but the reality is that you probably do need to change. Uh, the second thing is to set a vision and an ambition and a timeline for change. The third thing is to prioritize. There's a wonderful matrix which I use, which is to think about change which is easy versus change which is hard, and then to think about 
things that are completely transformative and things that are rather pointless. And what we tend to see is that most people obviously focus on transformative and easy first. Those are the kind of no-brainers. Like you would be silly for not having a website. You would be uh, ridiculous for not accepting Google Pay or Apple Pay on your website because it takes five minutes. Um, but often companies are quite drawn towards the frivolous. They quite like the things that are easy, um, but are also kind of pointless. Um, so it's interesting to see how companies prioritize using this matrix. One would imagine that we go from the no-brainers to the reinvention. Um, or perhaps from the no-brainers and, and slightly sort of down. Um, but what tends to happen more than not is we go for the kind of easy, low-hanging fruit that makes a difference, and then we just carry on with the very easy thing that doesn't make a difference. It's the kind of pointless PR stunts. The fourth thing, um, everyone needs to be extremely excited by technology. It sounds quite stupid, but companies need to really, really embrace what it means. They need to get very behind it. That doesn't mean chasing every shiny thing, but it means having a culture of people that are curious about what technology means. The fifth thing is that you don't have to wait. I think there is this excuse that somehow 5G will come next and we need to wait for that, or blockchain will get better and we need to build with that. Whether it's a new software system, whether it's a new policy, we have everything we need now. Uh, this is not made by me, but this is a kind of design concept that uh, I found. And it just shows how miraculous something like the process of checking into a flight could be. The process of buying a flight, the process of checking in, the process of entering a lounge. Everything could actually be delightful just using the smartphones of today, 4G connectivity of today, behaviors of today. So we have everything we need right now. Uh, the sixth thing, leverage what you have. Um, every business pretty much has a kind of incumbent and a challenger. Often there are many incumbents, often there are very many challengers. But if you're the challenger, it's easy to be sort of jealous by what the legacy company has. But if you're a legacy company, it's also very easy to be jealous about what the challengers have. Whereas I think every company on this planet needs to be aware of the wonderful thing that they have that their competitors would love. A company like Tesla would love to have um, a system in place like BMW to be able to perfectly um, replace and repair parts with their cars. A company like Shake Shack would love to have the kind of financial stability of Burger King. A company like the BBC would love to have the technology of Netflix, but Netflix would also love to have the reputation for trust that the BBC has. Seven, accept that it's easier to build than it is to change. Um, a lot of work right now requires rethinking our mindset for the future. Uh, many large companies, in my mind, act a little bit like 50 or 60-year-old human beings. And there is this feeling that somehow we should be embarking on yoga. This is all a metaphor, by the way. Uh, we should be buying sort of fancy sports cars and pretending that we're young. Perhaps we should be living in loft apartments in cities. Perhaps we should be uh, embracing the power of, of surgery and cosmetic surgery to look younger. Uh, perhaps we need to have like real therapy to sort of learn how to be young and, and full of life again. Whereas if you're a human being and you're 50, it would never occur to you really to do this. What you do is you would have kids. So what, is this, what does this kids metaphor mean for your business? How do you take your DNA, your love, your support, and embrace this as you bring up younger versions of yourselves while giving them freedom? Number eight of 10, uh, culture is more important than technology. Culture change is extremely hard. And when people talk about digital business transformation, increasingly they need to be thinking about cultural transformation. How do you bring in best of class talent from different fields? How do those people work together? Where do you work? How do you trust each other? What are the best workflows? How do you ensure that you recruit against the culture? How do you bring up a company with a relentless thirst for new knowledge and curiosity? You will find in the future that knowledge becomes less important. The internet means that we don't need to know as much stuff as we did before because we can find it whenever we want. Increasingly, attitude 
the drive to change, taking responsibility, being risky, but in a responsible way, working well with others, empathy, building relationships. These are the attitudes and the values that will really help every company in the future. And it would be wonderful to start recruiting more around those. So my final point is um, to be optimistic. Like these are days full of rapid changes and they are testing times. They feel chaotic, but this is an incredibly good time to be alive. Uh, we are blessed with being at a point in time where we have new technology and we now have the chance to, to work around not memories of the past, but around new possibilities. We get to look forwards. We get to realize that on our watch, we will be the people who create the future of marketing. We will be the people who create the future of advertising. We will be the people who create the future of business. That's a pretty cool time to be doing our jobs. So I think this is probably, in fact, almost without doubt, the best time ever to work in business. Thank you very much. And thank you, Tom. Thank you for your great presentation. I want to ask you one question yes. before I let you leave the stage. <laughs> Because when we innovate, we are very much affected by what happens in the world. Yeah. That makes changes. And you're talking about it's a challenging time right now. We're in a situation where we uh, tend to be less social. We have to stay in smaller groups uh, for our own health and for others' health also. How do you see this, uh, this health situation that we're in now affecting the way that we innovate? What kind of roads will we take from here uh, when it when we're talking about innovation also to sort of support the situation that we are in? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely in times where the, the changes in the world are unknown at the moment. And it's very hard to have real certainty about what this will be, but definitely what it will mean. I think um, the reality is that it's about time we worked in a different way. This idea that everyone comes to the same building at the same time for the same days, for five days a week, Uh, it makes less and less sense. Like most people who are watching this are working in a business which is based around the value that they add through their brains. And if you're in that business, um, being outside the office is wonderful. Having time to think is wonderful. Being st less stressed is vital. Um, so I think what we really need to do is to establish a way to trust each other. It sounds quite kind of... Um, sort of romantic, but if you work with a global team of people, if you work uh, different hours to other people, but if you know that people are doing their best jobs, if you know that people are reliable, then actually this is probably a very good thing in many ways for how we work. Yes, because for for years we've actually been talking more about working from home, yeah. how important bandwidth is yes. to do this, yeah. and um, the four-hour work week and yeah. things like that. Do you think that that's going to get like an acceleration because of the situation we're in now? Um, I, I, if, if you look to some predictions, then absolutely. And I think that's a very good thing. Um, we need to understand that in coding there's this principle of 10x coders, and it means that there are some people who would just 10 times better than others. And many of us work in 100x businesses. If, if you come up with a wonderful idea, uh, it may take you a half a second to come up with that idea, and it might be worth a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to create an environment where we're able to come up with those ideas, where we're then able to implement them. Uh, and, I and, think and maybe talk more qualitatively than quantitatively about abs time. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And yes. I think um, we, we get stuck in the kind of uh, time and materials business mm -hmm. when we need to be in the deliverables business mm -hmm. and the creation of value. And I think um, this, this could be a good thing that we rethink our businesses around. So again, so far we've augmented our, our, our jobs with technology. We, we add in video conference calls, we add in uh, Google Docs. If we are to rethink our businesses in a world where that exists, you will realize that the monthly status meeting is done remotely. Um, people work from home more often. We might have quarterly uh, week away sessions in beautiful lakeside retreats and everyone may end up feeling much more happy and doing incredible work. Thank you very much to Tom Goodwin. Great talk and thanks for asking uh, for answering some questions here at the My end. My pleasure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, everyone.